Now, from WYDC-TV, this is Big Fox News at 10. Good evening. Thanks for choosing Big Fox News. I'm Nick Smith. Though the primary for the New York City's mayor's race was yesterday, we may not know who won on the Democratic side for weeks. That's because it's New York City's first election with ranked choice voting. In tonight's top story, Dan Bowens spoke to election experts who say getting it right is more important than getting it done quickly. It is serious this year for me. The historic 2021 mayoral primary, remembered as much for its diverse candidates and challenges because of the pandemic, as it will be for the new way New Yorkers had to cast a ballot, ranked choice voting. The ranked choice made me think more about my decision as to who to vote for. The new system allows people to select up to five candidates in order of preference. On primary night, we will receive unofficial results for the first choice of people who voted in person. Why should New Yorkers have some patience tonight? Because getting democracy right takes some time. More specifically, says Common Cause New York Executive Director Susan Lerner, candidates need to capture 50% of the vote to win outright on election night, but that's not expected. So because of changes to state laws, everyone has to wait until all the absentee ballots are counted, and that will take at least another two weeks. So we've got a seven-day grace period for the absentee ballots to arrive by mail, and we have a seven business day time period to cure any mistakes which voters might have made in sending in their absentee ballots. But then finally, the official count, including the all important rankings of every candidate's total results, will start after that. So what will happen is in a week, if it is necessary to use the ranked choice voting rounds, we will see the first round happen and then Two weeks from now, we will see another set of rounds that will include all absentee ballots, overseas ballots, military ballots. So we need to be patient. New York is saying thank you to its essential workers. Governor Andrew Cuomo says they will be honored with a monument in Lower Manhattan. The Circle of Heroes monument will have an eternal flame in memory of those who died from coronavirus. Nineteen maple trees will surround it, representing each category of essential worker. The monument will be unveiled on Labor Day. Lawmakers in North Carolina are debating whether the state should be able to require masks in school. Laura Leslie has more. The governor's current executive order requires students to wear masks in schools through the end of July. That's in keeping with the CDC guidelines because most children are too young to be vaccinated. However, Representative David Willis said data seems to show most children are not at high risk for severe illness from COVID. His bill would let local school boards decide whether to require masks in the upcoming school year. Uh, what we don't know is the irreparable harm that we're doing from a mental health perspective. It's time to give our children the opportunity to return to normal, to remove the mask for the upcoming school year. As you know, middle school can be a very challenging time. Will has brought an unusual witness to testify in favor of his bill. His youngest son, Jackson Willis, a rising eighth grader in Union County. We know that masks have impacted learning, but they have also impacted our mental health. I can no longer receive reassurance from our teachers, not even a simple smile. I cannot see or hear my friends with their masks on. The younger Willis said the mask requirement violates the Declaration of Independence. As legislators, your power is given to you by the people, and we do not consent to giving you this power over us. Democrats on the committee said the state should continue to follow CDC guidelines. They were also concerned some school districts might ban masks outright, which could put high-risk students in danger. A school board meeting in Virginia turned contentious yesterday. The Loudoun County Sheriff's Department says that two people were arrested, one for trespassing, the second for disorderly conduct. The school board discussing several issues, including a proposed policy change to allow transgender students to use their preferred pronouns. Annalisa Gale has the story. Vote no on policy 8040. Bring back the quality education that this county was once formerly known for. It's absurd and immoral for teachers to call boys girls and girls boys. Retired Senator Dick Black was the last person to speak at a Loudoun County School Board meeting on Tuesday night before the public input session was suspended. 
School Board Chair Brenda Sheridan repeatedly warned the audience members that, quote, loud public demonstrations violated decorum before a unanimous vote to call off the input session. There's been a motion to end public comment. People were screaming, they were cursing, they were throwing things at the school board. More than 200 people were scheduled to share their opinions on everything from critical race theory, which the county has repeatedly stated is not being taught in schools, to a proposed policy which would allow transgender students to use names and pronouns that they prefer. Transgender parent Chris Candace Chuck has attended several meetings on the issue in the midst of Pride Month. This is shameful. At the end of the day, we're very hopeful the school board is going to continue to do what's right for our children, protect transgender children. The school board has appealed a judge's recent decision to reinstate teacher Tanner Cross, who spoke out against the proposed policy for transgender students, citing his religious beliefs. The Biden administration is supporting ending the racial disparity of sentencing for cocaine offenders. In 1986, the Anti-Drug Abuse Act mandated sentencing guidelines like a minimum of five years in federal prison with no parole for possession of five grams of crack cocaine. Critics have argued there should not be stricter sentencing for crack than powdered cocaine since it is the same substance. The law has led to the incarceration of thousands of people of color over the past decades. The Eliminating a Quantifiable Unjust Application of the Law, known as the Equal Act, aims to counteract that law. It is a bipartisan measure. The head of the Office of National Drug Control Policy testified in support on Tuesday. The Supreme Court also siding with a high school student who was punished by her school for cursing online. The court ruled that a Pennsylvania teen was protected by the First Amendment when she posted a profanity-laced caption on Snapchat while off school grounds. In 2017, Brandy Levy, who was 14 at the time, didn't get a spot on the varsity squad at her high school. So she reacted by cursing online. When school officials found out, they suspended her from the JV team. Justice Stephen Breyer, who penned the majority opinion, wrote, quote, sometimes it is necessary to protect the superfluous in order to preserve the necessary. The past year has been tough on everyone, especially teenagers, who for the most part were forced to stay home and away from friends because of the pandemic. A new CDC study says that suspected teen suicide attempts have increased significantly since the same time last year. Bridget Chavez has more. Dr. Johnson from OHSU says it's important for parents not to just rely on their teens to come to them, but they should be checking in on them, asking them questions about self-harm, especially if their teens are showing signs of anxiety or depression. Teens and their families have been under a heavy amount of stress this past year because of the pandemic, and that's reflected in new numbers from the CDC showing attempted teen suicides are on the rise. That is my impression and clinical judgment. I mean, so, so much of our coping strategies went out the window, especially for teenagers. Teenagers cope by getting outside the family and being with friends and, and um, peers and doing activities and being more independent. And this led to more dependence. Dr. Kyle Johnson, a child psychiatrist at OHSU, tells me the hospital saw 38 patients in May of 2021 seeking care for suicidal ideation or self-harm compared to 23 the year before. While this increase is concerning, Johnson says parents can take a proactive approach by talking to their teens about suicide. We know from research that bringing up suicide does not put thoughts in, in uh, people's heads, does not lead to more uh, adults or youth attempting suicide. Johnson says it's important to ask teens questions, especially if they show signs of depression or anxiety. Here's an example of how to bring it up with your teen. We are all under considerable stress right now. I know that this pandemic has had a huge impact on you and your friends. You're not able to see your friends, not able to attend school in person, and that can lead any of us to get down. And I wonder if you've been feeling down or depressed or sad. Johnson says to follow up with more questions. Well, sometimes when we're down or really depressed or not feeling good about the the situation, we may have thoughts of wanting to die or end, end our lives. Are you having those thoughts? Depending on their response, Johnson says you may need to reach out to a primary care doctor or if your child expresses intent, bring them to the emergency room. 
That's why we want to be checking in with them. We shouldn't just rely on them reaching out to us. We need to be, as adults, need to be checking in with them. Johnson also says it's crucial for parents to make sure teens can't get to things like guns or medication. Because so many suicide attempts in our youth are impulsive, often just minutes between making the decision uh, to kill oneself and actually engaging in behavior that could lead to someone dying. It is important to note, per the Oregon Health Authority, that the state has not seen an increase in youth dying by suicide. And while that is positive, it does not lessen the mental health challenges that teens are facing. Still ahead tonight, the Derek Chauvin trial has now become a teaching tool for aspiring lawyers in St. Paul, Minnesota. How do you not take advantage of that for our law students and give them the opportunity to take a deep dive in all of these legal issues and social issues? All the professors of this course believe this can be a unique teaching opportunity for their students. Here's your local stock market update from Big Fox. Now, your Twin Tiers forecast from Big Fox. Tonight's Big Fox forecast is brought to you by William Attar. A lot warmer conditions today than it was yesterday, but still temperatures were a little bit below normal. 10 degrees warmer in Elmira and also in Corning, 10 degrees warmer in Bath. Watkins Glen reporting about 10 degrees warmer this afternoon than it was yesterday. Still dry air in place. Winds coming in from the west northwest at around 5 miles per hour in uh, Corning, but about 12 miles per hour reporting in uh, Perkinsville. And this is keeping the dry air in place and also that cool air in place. But by tomorrow, as the high pressure system that's building into the twin tiers starts to move off to the Atlantic, it will allow for south winds to return. And so we are expecting a little bit more moisture re to return by the end of the week. But right now, our dew points are around 45 degrees, very dry air that's in place. By tomorrow, it should be back into the 50s and possibly warm up, or I should say increase into the 60 degree mark uh, as we make our way into uh, the weekend. So our forecast is calling for dry conditions tomorrow as that high starts to shift into uh, the Atlantic, allowing for south winds to return. And so uh, we are expecting that warming trend to continue for your Thursday. Our average high for tomorrow is around 80 degrees, and I think we'll get there. In fact, I think we're just going to have just an average, just beautiful summer like day. 68 degrees at uh, 9 o'clock in the morning, 76 by 11 o'clock and then by 3 o'clock around 80 degrees and then temperatures drop back down into the 70s by the early evening hours under a mostly clear sky. But again, as that high pressure system starts to move into the Atlantic, south winds will continue to transport moisture northward. And so as a result, the air will feel a little bit more sticky over the weekend and we are expecting the warm conditions to continue but it's going to make those temperatures feel about 5 to 10 degrees warmer. Here's a look at your lows tonight. It is going to be a chilly start to the day tomorrow with lows around 47 degrees in Elmira, 48 degrees in Corning, 51 degrees in Perkinsville. Highs tomorrow a lot warmer than today, 80 degrees in Corning and in Elmira, 78 degrees in Bath and also in Perkinsville. Plenty of sunshine during the day on Thursday as well as on Friday. Highs will be in the mid 80s on Friday and then we drop back down to around 81 on Saturday with the possibility of an afternoon thunderstorm or two. Notice overnight lows will also climb up in the 60s over the weekend. That's an indication of that humid air that will move in. Thunderstorm chances from Sunday through the middle of next week. We do have another cold front coming in and that will cause those temperatures to drop down into the low 80s by Wednesday and we are expecting a few showers as well. A coronavirus variant first identified in India is poised to become the dominant strain in the United States. And top U.S. health officials warned that it could cause a COVID-19 resurgence across the country later this year. Mandy Gaither explains why in today's Health Minute. It may already account for one in every five COVID-19 infections in the U.S. The Delta variant is currently the greatest threat in the U.S. to our attempt to eliminate COVID-19. 
New research suggests that variant is spreading more quickly through areas where fewer Americans are vaccinated, and top U.S. health officials believe it will be the predominant variant in the U.S. in the months, if not weeks, ahead. This is the, the most uh, transmissible of all the variants that we've seen, and we, and we saw what happened in the U.K. where it overtook the entire nation, so I'm worried that's going to happen in the U.S. A recent model finds a Delta-like variant that's assumed to be 60 percent more transmissible than the Alpha variant first identified in the U.K., coupled with 75 percent of eligible Americans getting vaccinated can result in COVID-19 bouncing back from summer lows to cause more than 3,000 deaths per week at various points during the fall and winter, coinciding with children returning to school and weather that pushes people people back indoors. But officials say the COVID-19 vaccines do provide protection against the Delta variant. Because of that, Dr. Anthony Fauci says it's unlikely there will be a return in the surge of COVID-19 cases seen in 2020. But he says there could be localized surges as summer continues in places where vaccination rates are lower. We have the tools, so let's use them and crush the outbreak. For Health Minute, I'm Mandy Gaither. The Derek Chauvin trial has become a teaching tool for aspiring lawyers in St. Paul, Minnesota. Chauvin is the ex-cop who murdered George Floyd and was found guilty of second and third degree murder and second degree manslaughter back in April. Now students at the Mitchell Hamlin School of Law are dissecting every move made by both sides. David Schumann has more. So it's going to be probably at 18. John Radson says the Derek Chauvin trial presents a unique teaching opportunity. Find the defendant guilty. Not because of anything that happened in the courtroom, but because it was the first in Minnesota history to be televised. And it's easier in the comfort of a classroom to play it, to rewind, but we ask ourselves, well, do, do we like how it's going along? Radson and Rick Petrie are co-instructing a course at Mitchell Hamlin School of Law called Advanced Criminal Law, Cops as Defendants. There are a lot of legal skills that they can glean from this case because they had a lot of good lawyers in that courtroom. How to prep expert witnesses, the merits of putting Chauvin on the stand, the defense's strategy, all topics to be studied and discussed. I think the consensus has been that the prosecution team did better than Eric Nelson. Eric Nelson had a tough, a tough case. The criticism that I've heard and I share is I think that Nelson chased too many different theories. The course is forward looking too. There was a hearty debate today about what the students feel Chauvin's sentence should be, as well as what they predict it will be. In Minnesota, it requires the criminal intent. The professors say it's rare to devote an entire course to one trial, but it's what the students wanted. How do you not take advantage of that for our law students and give them the opportunity to take a deep dive in all of these legal issues and social issues? Most people tip at least 15% after having a meal at a restaurant or bar. But the staff at one New Hampshire restaurant got that and a whole lot more from a generous customer who must have really been impressed by the chili dogs. Gene Mackin has more. A customer stopped in to the Stumble Inn Bar and Grill in Londonderry and ordered up a couple chili cheese dogs, fried pickle chips and drinks. The tab with tax, $37.93 before he added a $16,000 tip. At first, the staff didn't even notice it. It was on the credit card statement. They put it down next to the register. And he said for three times, don't spend it all in one place. That's what made her flip it over and look. And she's like, oh my God, are you serious? And then he's like, I want you to have it. You guys work high. The eight bartenders working contacted the owner. Thought it was a mistake. Could have been like a, a, a maybe a $160 tip and he got it extra zeros and the bar manager talked to the gentleman and he said, no, it's 16,000. The big tipper wants to stay anonymous. We're told he's not a regular. He just said that they deserve it. They work very hard. The Stumble Inn closed a few months during the pandemic, adjusted with takeout and outdoor dining. Like so many restaurants, it was a challenge for the staff and they're paying it forward to their fellow employees in the back of the house. The back of the house works really hard, the kitchen. They're giving them a big tip out of that, which is very generous of them too. The owner says every tip is appreciated, but this one is the biggest in the history of the Stumble Inn. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> maybe to date, maybe there'll be a bigger one for the staff, who knows. 
Warren Buffett is leaving the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. The 90-year-old investor announced he was resigning from his trustee position. He didn't explain why. It comes about a month after Bill and Melinda Gates announced their divorce. Buffett has now resigned from all corporate boards other than his company's Berkshire Hathaway. Since its founding in 2000, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has spent nearly $54 billion on initiatives related to global health, poverty, and most recently, the global rollout of the COVID-19 vaccine. Krispy Kreme is going public. The initial public offering is next week. The donut giant has been private since 2016 when it was bought by a private firm. According to Barron's, the chain is hoping for a nearly $4 billion valuation, which will help pay off some debt. Krispy Kreme is offering roughly 26.7 million shares of stock at $21 to $24 per share. The ticker symbol will be DNUT and will list on the NASDAQ. There's a lot of trash at the bottom of the Great Lakes, but if you look hard enough, you just may find some treasure too. That's what happened in Michigan after a diver found a decades old message in a bottle in a local marina. Kevin Hodge has more from the diver who found the note and the daughter of the man who wrote it. I know the date on the uh, bottle was November 1926 and his birthday was in November and it wouldn't surprise me if he just did that on his birthday. During a late evening dive on Friday, owner of Nautical North Family Adventures, Captain Jennifer Dowker discovered a 95 year old artifact. I spotted that green bottle on the top of a fish bed. So I'm like, oh, well that looks cool. So I reached down and grabbed it and grabbed it and noticed there was paper in it. So immediately I was like, all right, this is great. The note inside read, will the person who find this bottle give this paper to George Morrow, Sheboygan, Michigan, dated 1926. After it was shared on Facebook, it quickly gained a lot of attention and eventually Dowker was able to find George's daughter. It was a total shock, but knowing my dad, um, he always liked to do little things like when we were building our basement, he was putting up the paneling and he put a note behind that. While she plans to come take a look at the note for herself in September, Primo says she would rather have Dowker keep it. I, you know, I was really hoping to get it back and I was going to frame it and everything. And then I started, when I went to bed last night, I started thinking about it. And it'll make my dad live on if I give it to Jen. Dowker says the bottle probably isn't the only interesting artifact in the bottom of the Sheboygan County Marina. So we found this the last time we washed the windows, and I found this one this time we washed the windows, so there's tons of cool stuff down there. We want to leave you with a smile tonight. Even Vatican City has its own friendly neighborhood Spider-Man. A man dressed as the popular comic book and movie superhero shook hands with Pope Francis. He's part of the general audience inside San Damasco Courtyard. If the Pope looks unfazed, that's because he's already familiar with the masked man's work. The 28-year-old dresses up as Spidey to cheer up sick kids in hospitals. He says he knows what they're going through because he also did some growing up in children's hospitals after he was born with a congenital malformation. He even gave the Pope a commemorative Spider-Man mask of his own. How cool is that? Thanks so much for joining us. Have a good night. We'll see you back here tomorrow.